Boom. Hello, friends. Hey, Michelle. I wanted to watch this so much, but ended up at the last minute scheduling on... Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure that you'll catch it on the replay, Michelle. I'm glad that you're here. Welcome. I hope everyone is well um, here or on the replay. I'm so glad that you are making time for me today. Rita's here. Hi, Rita. Um, Eden Ca so Eden Castile, who is a phenomenal voice teacher, singer, performer, pianist, composer, all around swell gal from Wakefield, Rhode Island, reached out to me recently about a couple of students that she has who are both pitch challenged in different ways, interesting ways, interesting people, interesting challenges. We've all had that student. Um, usually we've had more than one, right? <laughs> the student who is perplexing in their understanding of pitch and melody. Or more accurately, they are perplexing in their strange combination of abilities and inabilities when it comes to matching pitch, being able to sing the melody. So now, you know that some voice teachers deal with their frustration with this kind of student, this conundrum, uh, in a way that can be unkind. We know that. We have seen that teacher. We've known that teacher. We've had that teacher's students when they're willing to give it a second shot. Now, I recognize that you are not that teacher and that you would not be unkind. Um, although <laughs> most of us have memories from our early years of teaching where we just go, oh, I wish I could go back in time and change that. But you know about this teacher who said the insensitive thing to the student. Now, while you, of course, try to be encouraging to all of your students, you do kind of understand the frustration that that unkind teacher or the teacher who said the unkind thing, um, you understand their frustration. It can really be a conundrum. I just got to use the word conundrum twice. So, <laughs> so the big picture is that we don't really know enough about the neurology of singing to be able to diagnose all the reasons that people cannot match pitch or have a hard time following a melodic pattern accurately. So according to Oliver Sacks, my hero, and, uh, well, he's not, well, he passed away, but he's a great, he was a great neurologist. And according to him, only about 1% of people have true amusia. And amusia is fancy talk for the inability to process different sound frequencies as different pitches. So what that means for us is that the likelihood that your student is actually tone deaf is remote. They're probably not tone deaf. There have been studies that uh, about exposure to music in early childhood. Uh, and based on these, it's generally accepted that kids who are exposed to music and singing when they're itty bitty will have a greater aptitude for pitch matching and for applied music later in life. <laughs> Big shock to us, right? Shocker. <laughs> they, they didn't have to do studies. They could have just asked voice teachers. But that is not what we're talking about today. We are not talking about the genuinely tone deaf person or the person who has a hard time matching a pitch. We're talking about the person who is perplexing. We're talking about the person who sings the first verse just fine and then veers off the melody in the second verse every time. Or the person who, no matter how time, many times you go through, how the introduction goes, and then when they come in, they never get it. Or the person who, having learned the song in the key of A, then continues to always sing it in the key of A, even when you're playing it in the key of B flat. Or the person... <laughs> Oh, hi, Wendy. 
or the person who confidently sings certain parts of the song, but then when they get to other parts of the song, they're sort of tiptoeing around the melody and they just, they know it's not working and they just don't know how to fix it. That person. So we've, we've, if you've been teaching more than a few years, we've had that person. Wendy's like, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, we've had that person. So that's who we're talking about today is that person, not the genuinely tone deaf person. It is possible that early in your career, you may have even been that person. My hand is up, says Rita. <laughs> yeah, we've had that person. Um, so, and we want to help those people. So it was, it's possible you may have been that person early in your career. And the reason that these, eh, never mind. That's because music educators do not think about how singers hear music. So that's what we're going to talk about today, because that is a powerful thing which is not examined in music education or even brought into anyone's awareness, but it's very powerful. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Yay! I'm Meredith Colby. I support voice teachers to create confident teaching of popular styles. I'm also the author of Money Notes, How to Sing High, Loud, Healthy, and Forever, which introduces neurovocal, which is a method of teaching popular styles that is healthy and based on brain science. Uh, please say hi. Add to the chat. If you're watching, say hi. Um, you can also add to the chat on the replay, by the way, I will get back to you. I'm pretty good about that. I was just about to say I'm very good about that, but I'm very good about almost nothing. So um, I'm, I'm pretty good about that. <laughs> also, if you like my page, that would be helpful. My, my freebie today is an article with the Julie. Hi, Julie. You love this. It is so empowering to be able to tell students they aren't beyond hope. Of course, they're not beyond hope. We love them. Okay. Um, my freebie today, you're going to like this. Julie Stone, you're going to like this because there's pictures in it. It is an article with the deliberately provocative title, Singers Are Stupid. Uh, I've been told by orchestra conductor and music theater coach, uh, the choir director who have read this, that they wish every music educator would, would read this article. So if you put the word ears into the comment, my brand new and super cool neurovocal bot will send you a link to that. You won't have to wait for me anymore. I've outsourced. Oh, good. I'm glad, Anita. Anita Hauser says, thank you. This video is right on time for me. Yay. Good. Um, so put ears in the chat and you'll be able to get, okay, Rita, you're, you, you, hopefully you'll tell me if this works. It's my first time with this new toy, so I really hope it works. Ha ha. I, Julie says, I've always jokingly said that singers are considered the blondes of the music world. <laughs> I know, right? Right? I know. I, you saw the joke I put in the promo for this, right? The, the, ever so hilariously funny joke, particularly when you, you're me and you've heard it dozens of times, or Rita, you've heard it dozens of times, the how do you know there's a lead singer at your door, except really, honestly, they say chick singer. How do you know there's a chick singer at your door? She can't find her key and doesn't know when to come in. Okay. All right. So let's get to it. Next week and the week after, I'm missing, I am not going to be broadcasting. I'm taking a couple weeks off, and then I will be back on August 17, just saying. Okay, so this is my theory about why singers often struggle with this. You do not have to remember this because you're putting ears in the, in the bot. It's working. Anita says it's working. Thank you. Okay, and it will send it to you. So you don't have to remember this. You just can listen. So the reason for their struggle is because the the way in which they listen to music. Now, so I'm going to start with a little story about me, the singer, first, and my husband, who is a music producer. He plays harmonica. He's an amazing singer, but he came up as a rhythm section player playing piano. That's where he came up. So here we are. 
he and I are listening to a song for the very first time and the song gets over and then you come up to us with your microphone and you say Meredith tell us about this song and I say tell you what the story of the lyric is about like what the lyric was and if you said to me can you sing the chorus if I've heard the chorus three or more times I will be able to sing the chorus right you guys too I'm guessing my husband on the other hand will tell you the time feel he will tell you the instrumentation he will tell you the production values and if you say what are the lyrics he'll go Mm, I'd have to listen to it again. That's what he'll say. And it is because of the way that we are listening, the manner in which we are listening to this music, that we are having this different experience with the first time we hear a song. Now, hold on. So this is to illustrate my point. There we go. There's my music triangle. If you look up music triangle on Google, they'll sell in to show you a lot of different music triangles, but they won't necessarily show you this one, this one I made. So the beat, so this is, the reason I made it a triangle is because people who, is because of the importance of each thing in the construction of a song. There we go. So the beat is the base of the triangle, right? How fast or slow the the song is going the pulse of the song above that is the rhythm the subdivisions so that you that create the feel of the song is it a march is it a salsa is it a swing tune next is the harmonic information above that uh, the chord progressions and sitting above on top of the chords of course is the melody and at the very tippy top is the lyric now my friends I am I'm fixing to make some generalizations about singers <laughs> or more specifically about your singer, the singer that I talked about at the beginning. Um, so please know that I am not talking about you. I am talking about struggling singers or novice singers or avocational singers. Kathy Glickman is here. Hi, Kathy Glickman. I will always remember you explaining to this, <laughs> this to me. Yes. Now, instrumentalists in general and rhythm section players in particular tend to listen to music this way from the bottom up. They instinctively assess the most important parts first. They instinctively assess the beat and the time feel and then they apply the harmonic progression to that. If they're a melody instrument, they will feel how the melody fits into the harmonic progression of the song. They may or may not have much of any awareness of the lyric. They typically don't think that much about the lyric, although some of them do. Drummers often do, <laughs> and they can be trained. Um, but what's important here about this particular triangle and the fact that I'm talking about instrumentalists and the way that they hear music is that they take this for granted. They don't think about it. They just hear, this is just how they hear music. They just intuit this way of hearing music. And these are the pictures in the freebie today, by the way, the one that you will get if you put ears in the chat. Singers, on the other hand, hear music this way, typically. This is how I just told you that I listen to music. This may be the way you listen to music too. I, I can take in the whole musical picture, right? I can hear all those parts, but I hear it from my singer biased vantage point. Oh, <laughs> Julie Stan says this is good. It makes so much sense, right? It is. It's so simple, but it's so true. But here now, Julie, I'm really about to blow your mind. Here's how your your melody challenged singer is hearing music. Ready? My same triangle. This way of listening means that they get the lyric and the intention of the song. They have a, a tenuous grasp of the melody. B 
because they may or may not, from measure to measure, have a sense of how that melody fits in with the harmonic progression. They probably do not have an understanding of the form of the song. For them, for popular music, almost always has form. Uh, like, they, but they understand it sort of like an aria, right? It starts here and it ends here. <laughs> That's, oops, no, up here. Eh, starts here, ends there. It's just a straight line from the beginning to the end, which makes it very difficult also to memorize songs if you don't know the form of the song. Um, the ability to find a harmony is not, they don't, they can't do that. Harmonies are not a thing they can do. And honestly, so I said this applies to your challenged singer and your novice singer, but I have worked with great professional singers who also hear music this way. Maybe not this much, like just all that other stuff the band is doing thing, <laughs> but, but still, you know, they still can't find harmony parts and they still are really locked into the way that they do it. The thing about the singer who listens to music like this, all that now I have to, I'm going to move it now because it's a really huge picture. The thing about the singer who listens like that, and many of them do, is that if you are listening like that, you're really walking on marbles. It is, it is nearly impossible to feel confident as a singer, to feel like really solid in, as a singer if you are listening to music this way. And yet, many of them do. And that is the perplexing student that I described at the outset. They almost certainly listen to music this way. Okay, now pipe up. Is this making sense to you with this student that I described earlier? The one who can somehow sing an E flat while you're playing a C major? The person who, who could sing the melody at the first verse, but can't on the second verse, that person, right? It makes sense because they're not hearing their part as, as part of a greater whole. And that's the thing. And that's where you come in. <laughs> and that's where you come in because you are an experienced voice teacher. And once you can think about this, this Rita says this makes total sense. Once you can think about the manner in which your singer is hearing, you will be able to help them through it. I believe that you will. Uh, I'm happy to share with you how I do it if you want to know, but I think that you will have your own way to do it. I don't think you need to know how that I do it because just knowing that this is how they're hearing will be will give you the tools to address the situation in a constructive and kind and helpful way that will move them forward as singers and give them that confidence that they really don't have. I mean, right? Singers who, who are veering off all the time, they know they're veering off. They just don't know what to do about it. So you're going to help them with that tool of what to do about it. So I cannot believe how short I was today. This is like my shortest live ever, but I'm kind of done unless y'all have something to put, to put in. Um, if you want the article Singers Are Stupid that has all these nice graphics in it, put ears in the chat and, I will, and the bot will send it to you. I am Meredith Colby and I support voice teachers to create confident teaching of healthy CCM pop styles. Uh, my book, Money notes and other good stuff can be found at meredithcolby.com. Oh, when he's going, no, Rita's saying, tell me what you do. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I won't sign off yet. Um, well, first of all, I, I my students are adults, almost all adults, and sometimes I have teenagers. So what I do is I explain this to them. I, as, as Kathy Glickman, who was my student, uh, said, I still remember this from so long ago. I, I show them this. I make them aware because when you are cognizant of something, you can begin to affect how you are using it. So 
what I ask them to do, I give them homework. Once they understand about this way of hearing, I ask them how they listen to music in their daily life. So let's say that somebody says, well, I commute. So I listen to music when I, on my commute, I will say to them, please spend one half of one song each day, just listening to the bass player. Just listen to what the, see if you can tune your ear. And when you are first listening to it, it will be very difficult for you to hear the bass player because your brain wants to listen to the song. But if you focus your attention on the bass player, you will notice that the bass will become more and more prominent in your hearing. And of course, we all know that to be true, right? Uh, also, uh, I will ask them to do the same thing with the drummer uh, or the guitar player, um, especially if somebody has a song that they really enjoy that has a really fun guitar groove. I'll say, I'll ask them to try to sort of sing along to a little fun acapella sort of version, vocal version of what they're hearing. Basically, I ask them to pull their attention away from the part that is familiar and easy to them, which is the singing part, and train their attention on the part that is less familiar and not as easy. Typically, after one or two weeks, a student will come back to me and say, it was really hard for me to hear the bass at first, and now I can hear it so easily. Because we've had that experience where if we pay attention to something, it grows, it grows larger in our consciousness. So that's what I ask them to do. And then, and this is just normal for me, but if somebody brings me a pop song that is, has a groove, has a rhythm section, we listen to it before we sing it. And we talk about what is in, what makes up this song? What are the components of this song? So that before they even begin to sing with me, obviously they've sung at home, but before they begin to sing with me, they have a framework of how they fit into the greater whole. Because this is not, this is not, uh, I'm trying to think, this is not a, a leader. In a leader, it's a piano and a voice, typically. And, and those two instruments work together. But in popular music, you are almost, the voice is really part of a greater whole. The singer is. And they have to, they have to know. And I don't necessarily mean cognitively know, although that doesn't hurt. <laughs> But they have to know intuitively how they fit into the greater whole. And those singers that we really love generally have a, a deep, deep sense of how they, as the melody instrument, who has the advantage of that the language, so the connection with the audience, the percussive elements of the, of the lyric, um, all those things, um, how that extra piece fits into the greater whole to really create cohesion. They can't just float over the top and not dig in. I'm sure that that made sense to some of you. <laughs> anyway, was that a good answer? It was probably way more than you bargained for. <laughs> because ask me and I'll just go off. Anyway, uh, I now, now I'm really going to call it because I've taken way too much of your time. I am Meredith Golby. I support voice teachers to create healthy, confident teaching of popular styles. Um, you can find more at MeredithColby.com. I'm going to take a little bit of time off, a couple of weeks off. I will be back on August 17th. I am grateful for your time and attention. Be safe. You, uh, Wendy says, I loved it. And when, Rita says, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for being here with me. Uh, I appreciate your time and I'm grateful for your attention. Be safe. Ask for what you need. Be well and have a great couple of, oh, Wendy's loving my book. Have a great couple of weeks, everybody. Bye-bye.